our next speaker was supposedly uh, uh, was a Christian Hunter uh, from Data Strax, but she couldn't join us today. Uh, but we do have Aaron Morton, uh, the field CTO, APAC at Data Trax for us to present the talk. Welcome, Aaron. Hi, Seth. Yeah, um, as you said, just um, joining on short notice. Uh, I want to just check you can hear me and my video is okay because we didn't get much of a, a check on that. Yes, you're, awesome. you're all set well. So, uh, and thanks for turning up so quickly <laughs> and still making it. So wonderful to have you here. And uh, you're going to talk today on C-Star made easy with Stargate APIs. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, just curious to see uh, what's coming out of the talk. So we awesome. can see your slides. Great. Hear you. The stage is right. yours. Thank you uh, very much. A uh, quick introduction. Um, as Sathya said, my name is Aaron Morton. I'm a field CTO at Datastack. So I look after APAC and our open source uh, commitments. I'm originally from country Victoria. I, I grew up there, uh, lived in Melbourne for nine years and then did the classic buy a one-way ticket and go to London thing. I was in London for nine years and I've been in New Zealand where I live here for the last 11 years. Let's start with you know, what is CSTAR and a little bit about Cassandra and a little bit about data stacks and what this technology is. I've been working on it for, since 2010. It's an open source Apache project. And then we're gonna get into some demos around the APIs that we've added to sit in front of Apache Cassandra on our managed service called Astra. So we'll just jump onto the next slide. So, Apache Cassandra, um, if you haven't heard of it, you've definitely had data stored in Cassandra. It was open sourced by Facebook in around 2008. And over those 12 years really has grown to power a lot of what we think of as the modern internet. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, for example, last time Apple spoke about using Cassandra, they had over a quarter of a million servers Netflix famously um, very much publicly scaled up on Cassandra, Spotify, uh, Uber, all those types of companies really built their ability to scale over the last 10 years on Cassandra. It's a peer-to-peer active-active replication model. It's a database that is one of our first NoSQL databases. In fact, I think we almost coined the term. Um, it doesn't mean it, it has no SQL. It just means we don't have a lot of the relational things. And we'll look at our CQL, which is very much like SQL, as we go along as well. Compare that to the APIs that we do have. Uh, some of the great things around Cassandra is that it is uh, very highly available. You can handle node failures. It's very scalable. You add more nodes, you get more capacity, you get more throughput. And uh, the data model works well for a lot of different use cases. To that end, uh, just these are some of the places that have publicly said that they depend on Apache Cassandra. Um, and as I said, if you've used the internet over the last 10 years, you've probably data stored in Cassandra uh, there in some way or another. And there are uh, certainly companies in Australia that depend on Cassandra or Datastax Enterprises, we'll see shortly, to store their data and manage things at scale. We're built on open source. Uh, that is, I'm a, pro, I'm a committer on the Apache Cassandra project. I'm on the project management committee. Uh, we are all built on open source. And it's been a challenging year, year and a half, as we ground out our version 4.0. And that was released earlier this month. And it's one of our most tested and, and stable versions of Cassandra ever. Uh, the, some of the large users of Cassandra insisted that it, they'd be able to put it into production uh, on day one of the, of the GA release, and they did that. So there's a great new version out there and a lot of pent-up features that will soon be, um, be worked on to get into, four point, into the point releases of the 4.0. 
So let's lay that groundwork. We've got this 12 year old open source database that is scalable and huge and able to handle all sorts of workloads and able to maintain availability when you lose nodes. So let's think about just how that ecosystem looks now. We also have a project data stacks worked on last year. We still work on called Kate Sandra. And this is working with the community to move Cassandra into the Kubernetes world. There are open source uh, Kubernetes operators, and we're working with the community on our one there. There's a couple out there, and we're kind of reaching this point where we have a stable view of what that operator should look like. And the Kate Sandra project is an open source project that gives you a production ecosystem out of the box. We then, from the DataStacks perspective, we have our DataStacks Enterprise, which is our long running enterprise version of Apache Cassandra, and then Astra, which is a, a fully managed uh, database as a service with uh, consumption-based pricing and serverless architecture. And that's what we're going to do our demos on today because that has our Stargate API sitting in front of it. And this API gives us different ways of talking to that same Cassandra back end. So traditionally, when you wanted to use Cassandra, you used a language called CQL, the Cassandra query language, which is a subset of ANSI SQL. Uh, actually, traditionally, when it first started, we used Thrift, but then we decided that wasn't too good. Uh, so we, we put CQL in front. And uh, that is great for some use cases, but limiting in terms of the developers who want to go and learn that language or the frameworks that that language will plug into. It was great for um, J2EE enterprise developers that's back in the day, six or seven years ago. Not always the case now. So now we've built several APIs to sit in front and a framework about how we can add more APIs that allow you to talk to Apache Cassandra. Uh, and these are the APIs that sit in front of DataStax Astra. So everything we do today, you can go and do in an open source world. You can take Stargate, it's an open source project, and put that in front of Cassandra that's actually wrapped up in the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, the Kate Sandra open source project as well. So moving left to right here, from sort of more structured to less structured, the Cassandra query language, as I mentioned, is an SQL subset very good for structured and key value data types, and, and it has strong typing. It is SQL compliant. We have support for GraphQL. Now, first example of that is how to do GraphQL over your existing Cassandra data models. So this is great for structured data, key value data as well. The typing is reasonably strong, though not as strong, and the hierarchy uh, in there is great for being able to join from table to table. Next, we've also added REST to give the largest um, set of developers access to Cassandra. There's traditionally over the years been microservices written that are basically uh, take a REST endpoint, turn that into Cassandra query language, get data out, turn it into JSON, and hand it back. And we want to get rid of doing that. That's kind of busy work. And lastly, we've added a document API. So taking in the JSON documents that are semi-structured, have those weaker JSON types compared to CQL, but then adding indexing onto that and treating it like a proper JSON document API, where we index every column, uh, every key field, sorry, and we're able to provide queries across the whole document without you having to do any of the databasey things that you'd expect to do with a CQL. So in a second, we're just going to jump in and look at comparing these four different API styles doing roughly the same thing. We're just going to make some tables in SQL and read and write data just to level set about what we have. Then we're going to do that and manipulate that same table with GraphQL, and manipulate the same table again with REST, and then we'll go to the schemaless document API. And when we're there, we need to, we might be working on the same data um, because the schema list is a lot different. We have to shred the JSON document and work that through. So 
doing all these demos on Astra uh, because this is the easiest way to do a demo. I can do it all in the browser. And in here, I can connect to my CQL console as if I was running this on my terminal. And I can drop in some CQL. So just to show you, this is very much just like SQL. There's nothing to be afraid of here. There's a primary key. It's a little bit more um, got a little bit more to it than SQL, but looks roughly the same. Uh, I'm going to insert some rows and do a select. Right. So we've got a, a list of cyclists here, um, their birthdays and some other information about them. I've done a table scan, which is okay with two rows, not too great if we had two million. Uh, I can do a select by the primary key, as you'd expect. And now I'm going to jump in here and do a select by something that's not index, not on the primary key. We haven't made a secondary index, and we get an error, just like you'd expect in a traditional database. So I can go and uh, put an an index on this, and now I can do a select against non-primary key. So it's basically a database, uh, sort of database where you can have hundreds of nodes working together uh, and doing millions of operations per second, or you can just have three nodes and, and be doing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of ops per second and not have to worry about uh, what happens when a node fails. So we've level set with just a basic thing. I'm going to jump over to GraphQL. And uh, I said I help make CQL, and I think GraphQL is just really exciting area to be in. So this is just running uh, the same type of query. We're just going on to GraphQL and saying, go to the cyclist table, query, and give me back the last name, the weight, and the nationality. And I don't have any type of criteria here. It is, once again, roughly speaking, a table scan. And I can run this same query. And this time, select by what is my primary key, which is the last name, which is great. And I can do a select on that secondary index I created, the nationality pull back that Smith as the as the the row there. So we're running against the same data and we've done some selects against it. So next step up, let's have a look at how we modify data. I'm going to insert a row and I'm getting some errors. I'm getting some errors because I've broken the schema as defined in graph in CQL and GraphQL is using the same schema. So it has the same data typing going on here um, that I've passed uh, a number here where it should be a string. So I'll just fix this up. Run it into it again and select back the just the last name. So I've added another row. And just because it's a live demo, I'm going to do the and now switch back here, and I can do a select and see I've added myself to the table and um, manipulating the same data with SQL and GraphQL. Uh, I can now do an update, and then this time instead of an insert, I'm going to run some updates. I'm going to add height to two rows at a time and pull back just the data I need, and then just to confirm that, read that back. So the GraphQL API lets you do pretty much all the things you want to do, you could do through the CQL API, which has a driver, which is a bit more heavyweight. Uh, so we can access this um, you know, with React, with Apollo, with Relay. You can also create schema. It's a little more unwieldy to do that as we are working through uh, adding GraphQL support will make that easier to do. But I think just given the ability to not to have to write microservices that are essentially just translating from SQL and the driver into something that uh, another service needs is great. Um, down here, you'll see there is a token that we're sending along. 
please don't take a screenshot of that. Probably shouldn't lift that there. Uh, but so you do have the ability to say, uh, create, a create an identity and just give them read access or let them only access a few tables that you need them to do if you are making this available inside your organization. So next over, we have uh, REST API. Um, it's got a Swagger front end. You can, again, do schema work. You can do some document API work, which we'll, we'll see in a minute in Postman. Um, but I can jump in here, and I can do a get against my table, get back all the rows. Again, in this case here, it's a table scan. Uh, it'll paginate, but uh, you may not want to do that if you have millions of rows in your one table. Um, I can also then do a patch. So jump down here. I can say I want to patch. Here's my primary key. And I just want to add a height to the Aaron because there wasn't an Aaron. Uh, Aaron didn't have a height before. Execute that guy. And just here I get back the data that we added. And uh, here's, here's my crew that's going to go across. So I can then also come back here and have a look at the all rows on that. Execute this guy. And now I can see I have my height as well. So the REST API gives you, again, all the types of functionality you would expect uh, to use through CQL. Um, again, you can create schema and do things. But in this, what we call like the, the CQL first world, where you're maybe defining your data model using the Cassandra query language first, uh, and that a lot of your work might go through that, this is a way to just take some of the repetitive work out of the story. So you may not need to use all the schema things, but certainly been able to just do uh, CRUD operations um, through GraphQL and REST against the same data that your Java or, or C Sharp app is using SQL for. It's really useful. So the last API to go and look at is the document API. So with our document API, we, uh, we kind of, there's three things we're looking to do here. We're looking to run without having to have a schema. We're looking to see that we can index every field. So then to do those create index calls. And then I can have documents that have different structures to them that can handle that. First query we're going to run is we're going to make a, a new collection called Cyclus and uh, add another add the Cyclus. So this is different set of data, it's not the same table as we had before. Well, it's always exciting when that comes back. So we've run our HTTP request here. Where is this guy? Let me be. Here we go. So let's do this with curl. So you can see we've just sent this HTTP request uh, and sent the JSON over to there. Close that up now. Uh, it's generated the document ID for us because we don't have a primary key. We don't have a schema. So it's just given us a doc ID. We always have one. And I can then read this back with a query just to pull, uh, do a get on the cyclist collection. And it gives me back the data. And here's that doc ID that it created for us. Uh, if I want to create a document with a doc ID, I can run this as a put and just put against that document ID. And again, if I come back now and look at all the documents I have, the first one we created where we didn't have a doc ID just gets a, a UID, and the second one gets the um, the doc ID that we gave it. So as you'd expect, I can do a select on this by the doc ID. Uh, and I can do a select by the last name, which was our primary key we had before. So in this case here, I put this where up here. But I didn't have to specify we had a primary key. I could just hit any field I wanted to. So I can use last name. Um, previously, we had to create an index to do a select on the nationality. Now I can run that without having to put an index on it. And I can go down all the types of combinations you'd expect here. I'm saying 
where uh, any field, uh, any key called weight uh, is greater than 67. I can pull back some rows. And these are under the stats field here. So started off with just being able to do be schema list, just make something, not have to specify my types and things up front, which is great. Um, and next thing we wanted to do, be able to do was, uh, we've, sorry, we've also shown that we've indexed all the fields. And the other thing we want to look at was how we can have documents that have different uh, structure. So for example, I'm going to go to the Smith cyclist here and I'm going to patch and add an address. And this gives me back the doc ID that it worked on. So I'm just going to go up here and collapse this down for a second and pull this back. So we can have a look. So yeah, Smith's now has uh, an address, but the original one for Richards doesn't. Uh, pretty standard doc document type things. I can pull that out. So I can do a get on the sub documents. Uh, I can uh, update and patch into the sub document. So really treating them as two, as, as two different document structures here and we can work on them in the same way. And then just pull this guy back and see that we've now got uh, got an address and it's got a time zone and everything that's different than what we had before in the doc IDs. I could go through all the different combinations, but I think we, we get the point here that we've got a way of doing things with SQL that is very structured. We've got different ways to be able to read and write that through REST and through Graph all the way up to the document API where we get uh, full JSON document support. Everything is Every field is indexed. I don't have to create my schema and I can have different document structures. All of that sitting in front of the uh, power and, and scalability of Apache Cassandra on the back end. So what are the types of use cases that people have for Cassandra? Um, pretty much anything really that, that is a database things where we don't have triggers, we don't have strong relation referential integrity. I think over the last uh, 11 years that those features for most applications are not as important. So some of the use cases are uh, persistent session stores, um, high throughput, low latency. I've seen this as backends for um, massive online games where your play state or what's um, or you know your shop or you, what's in your um, inventory and things like that are, are held and that is at the scale of tens or hundreds of millions of users uh, access for, for user data um, just regular old user data for apps and websites at, at scale um, Spotify is someone who's spoken a lot around the Cassandra usage and Netflix. You can imagine you know, what's in your wish list. You can imagine your play history and things like that, uh, the types of things that, that fit there. So regular kind of database-driven things. Including that, uh, the Cassandra data model works really well with time series data, uh, models that pretty well, and allows you to have a sliding windows of things. So if you want to track user activity over a period and have that be uh, windowed out works really well for that. Um, see a bunch of use cases in AI ML where we need to be able to pull out a bunch of data to enrich an event or enrich something that's happened so we can put it through the model um, and be able to just have random access to your data at, at millisecond latency over uh, hundreds of terabytes is, is a great use case. And similar with um, business intelligence style workloads. But I think with this, uh, you know, for, for APIs, being able to connect uh, microservices and front ends onto something like Cassandra without having to jump through all the hoops that a driver may present is a great advance and uh, something I hope will make a lot easier for people to get onto running Apache Cassandra. So with that, uh, Satya, 
Yes. Well, I did the I did the inception thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> back over to this side. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I had a question on the use cases. I was mm -hmm. thinking I should ask uh, once you're done with your with your presentation, but your last mm -hmm. slide did talk about the use cases, so which is wonderful. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the other questions, maybe I don't know whether you touched on it, maybe I didn't see in, in the demo, how is security handled in, in the Stargate APIs? Aaron? Yeah, so it's a token-based API uh, behind this, the the scenes, Cassandra has a role-based access control similar to any type of database. Make role gives them different access controls onto different tables, uh, have users be in roles, that type of thing. Uh, Stargate puts in front of that a token-based control so that it's easier to pass through the APIs as you, as I managed to leak in my little demo there. You know, you've got uh, just a token that you pass that maps through to a set of permissions. Yeah, wonderful, cool. And um... And is this only uh, used um, for Apache Cass uh, Cassandra or any other sort of databases at the back? Or for now, it's yeah. only Cassandra? So it's, Stargate at the moment is coded to run against Apache Cassandra or Datastax Enterprise, our, our uh, enterprise version of that. Um, we think it's interesting times in what is a database or a data service or a data platform or what we are going to expect to get out of the places we store data in the future. Um, so we're, one of the reasons we're doing this in open source is to get more uh, more opinions on what sorts of other backends we people should have access to. We see when we talk to uh, enterprises around the world that they are building enterprise data platforms that have common API front ends that talk to one, two, three different types of database backends that I want to standardize on the GraphQL API, for example, and say, well, most of our workloads will, can go through GraphQL and talk to Cassandra or Elastic or, or, or Redis or whatever it is. We don't need to have custom APIs for each. And if we've got a standard portal that everyone can get through, it's easier for us to have a standard approach to security to have a standard approach to our audit controls, to have a standard approach to how we manage access and things. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Thank you so much, Aaron. It was a last minute notice and you flipped and you mm -hmm. made a great presentation. So it's, um, uh, it's great to have you here and uh, uh, thanks and would hope to see you soon in many more conferences. Thanks.